Welcome to week six slash seven. It's week of instruction number six. It's week seven of the term because you guys had a week off last week. Air quotes. At least had it off from me for the most part. Um, we are starting into the part of the course where we talk about database server administration. Yay. Um, this is the part of the course where we cover uh, doing backups and user administration and apparently replication which may not need to be taught because um, apparently Jerome's covering that networking this week so I guess I'm going to fire him off I don't ask him <laughs> okay therefore that's why I'm teaching replication all right um, but these are the three topics for the next three weeks. So database backups this week, then backup strategies. Next week is user administration and security. Week after that is basically replication, which is another form of backup, which will be followed again by our joys of joys, another test and practical. Then onwards to the rest of the term. So that's your next four weeks with me. So that's the quick summary of what's coming down the pipe. Um, now I'm going to go turn on the screen and turn off some lights so we can start the slideshow. The documents should theoretically be up on Blackboard. I'm not Blackboard, Canvas, sorry. And uh, well, we're going to have another one of those days. Okay, press that button. Now what happens? Oh, everybody sits in the dark. Now, if I want that, there we go. Yes, I'll cut that out of the video if I remember to. All right, so like I said, it says week six here, because normally that's what's covered in week six, but week six was tequila week. So this is week seven with week, week six content. All right. So like I said, today's topic is the backup. And normally I don't launch into this with a question, but the question is, is what is a backup? Now, those of you guys working computers should know what a backup is. A backup is a procedure for making extra copies of stuff. Why are backups important? How many of you have lost crap off your laptop or off your phone? Yeah. Well, actually, this that example of, you know, shit disappearing off your computer because you've dropped it in a puddle is not as critical as it used to be. But that used to be a really good example. Uh, OneDrive, Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever you want to, whichever one you want to use, Sugar, they all do stuff like this. And they work just fine. But the process of a backup is to make sure you got copies so that if something horrible happens, you have a chance to get it back. Um, now, there's some terminology that comes with backing up. And I'll get rid of the terminology talk right off the bat. OK, starting at the left, there's hot backup and cold backup. A hot backup is a backup that is designed to recover live. In other words, you're taking snapshots of the database as things are happening. Um, you're taking point in times, binary logs, that kind of stuff. A cold backup is where you lock access to the server, dump the files, the database completely to a file, and back up that file. Also with that you'll also back up configuration and that kind of stuff so that you can build a new server from this backup without a lot of pain. Um, you got online, offline, and off-site. Online backups means the backup that's done live. It goes with the hot backup. That means you're backing up the database server while people are still accessing it and changing stuff. Offline backup means you turned off the server, you back off, back up the images of the, the directories, 
And then what often goes off site means you're not keeping it in the building. Um, for example, where we work, we do a three part backup. We have a backup server in the server room with tons of disks. We back up to that. We have another server sitting at the other side of the building that we back up to. Why? Because we can recover quickly if something goes wrong from the other side of the building. Then we also have an offsite backup so that if, you know, the building burns down, at least we're going to get, you know, a copy from offsite. We run that one nightly. Um, so that's the online, offline, offsite. Now, there's three kinds of backups. There's a full backup, an incremental backup, and a differential. A full backup is as if you copy the entire contents of the database. Usually that's part of a cold backup. An incremental backup backs up the changes since the last full backup. So let's say you do a full backup on Sunday night. The incremental will run on Monday. It'll only back up the differences since Sunday. And then you've got the differential. On Tuesday, you back up only the differences between Tuesday and Monday. I've got a graph in a minute explaining this, what the difference is between them. But essentially, let's say your database is a gigabyte. On Sunday, you back up a gigabyte. On Monday, you might back up 250 megs because that's the differences between Sunday and Monday. And on Tuesday, you're only going to back up the differences between Tuesday and Monday, which means you might only back up 100 megs of 250 megs. The only backup partials. So if you want to do a restore, you got to restore Sunday, restore Monday, restore Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Incremental is it's the first backup after the full backup. So on Sunday we do a complete dump, one gig. On Monday we do an incremental. Therefore, it's the differences between um, Monday and Sunday. On Tuesday, if we did another incremental, it would be all the differences between Tuesday and Sunday. But the differential is the difference between Tuesday and Monday. So you're backing up less and less as you go through the week. Well, actually, after that, it would stabilize, right? You go big, medium, small, and be small the rest of the week. That's if you're dealing with terabytes of data. When you're dealing with a couple hundred megs, it doesn't make a difference. Um, there's data compression. I guess you guys know what compression is. I think I don't need to explain that. You take the backup and you zip it, or you gzip it if you're on Linux. Uh, data dupl duplication. Some backup software is really, really clever, and it'll actually look at the files and remove duplication out of the files and just put a pointer in that file. It's a bit like how a zip, zip works, where it finds patterns and replaces patterns with, with smaller patterns. Um, and data encryption. You guys should all know about encryption by now. Um, you know, you don't want people that you don't want, you don't want everybody to be able to read your data. Therefore, you should encrypt it. Um, then there's something called a backup window. The backup window is, when can you do the backup without affecting anyone? It's a window in time. Um, and the backup job is, when do, it's the actual process that creates the backup. All right, so here are the type of backups. So I'm trying to explain that with a little information, more information. A full backup, which is known as a level zero, is a complete backup of the database partition or the database itself. So an example, a full backup is two terabytes. If you did a full backup all week, you'd be doing a two terabyte backup every single day all week. Two times seven is 14. Right, so your database backup for a week would occupy 14 terabytes. If you're doing an incremental, the one on Sunday is two terabytes. The one on Monday is one gigabyte. Then it might be 1.2, 1.6. It'll slowly grow until the incremental is actually bigger than the original database because the incremental grabs the differences. So two terabytes, the original one. Monday will be one gig. There'll be 1.2 gig the next day because it includes all the changes from this day plus the original. Then this will include this one plus this one plus its own plus the, you know. So it'll build up. And then you got the differential, which is two terabytes the first day, 
one gigabyte the second day. And actually, this is GB, GB is 2.8 gigabytes. I misread the letter there. Then it'll say a 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, because you're only grabbing the differences from the previous day. So the backups are really, really small. Um, this used to be really important on a day where storage was a premium. Nowadays, storage is not always a premium. If you've got a database that's two terabytes, the odds are you've got the disk system to handle a two terabyte database. That means you've got the budget for a really large backup system. Um, the problem is with the full database, uh, the full backup, how it takes a long time to dump two terabytes. Like, how long does it take you to copy? Yes, yeah, exactly. You're going to copy the last movie you downloaded from one drive to another drive. How long does it take to copy it across your computer? It takes a few minutes, right? Or are you copying it to your portable drive so you can hand it off to someone else? It takes a few minutes. Now imagine if you were copying two terabytes every night. It's a killer. You only have so much time. That's why people do full backups usually only once a week unless the database is small enough. But thus, full backups on Sunday and then you roll through the rest of the week. All right. Bit of strategy. Obviously, Ideally, you back up everything all the time and you keep it forever. But if you're doing two terabytes, two terabytes, two terabytes every day, 14 terabytes a week, 50 plus terabytes a month, you know, at the end of the year, 12 times 60, let's say, because the database backup is going to get bigger and bigger because you're accumulating more data. That's an awful lot of backup. So that doesn't work. So because it's so real estate, we can't do that. So you need a combination of short-term and long-term. So you should have three copies of the data, one of which is off-site. So that's what we're doing where I work. You have a backup on the server. You have a backup on a backup server that's either in the same server room or across the building. And then you have a backup that's off-site. So here's the perk, right? So the backup that's on the primary server, the database server has a backup, a file of the backup that was taken last night at midnight. And you're saving that file in a different partition. So you guys know about partitions, right? Partitioning your disks, more than one hard drive. So same computer, you store it on a different hard drive. What does that protect you against? Anybody want to take a shot? Guess what that protects you against? Yeah. Yeah, so if you lose a hard disk, you just pop in a new disk, restore the database, and you're, you're good to go. You have a backup on a different machine, say, in the same room. What does that protect you from? Because something happens to the computer itself. For example, the RAID, control melt, the RAID controller melts itself and wipes all the disks. Don't laugh. It's happened. I once walked to a server room, there was smoke coming out of the back of the computer. And the battery, had the battery, the Lion battery on the RAID controller had melted itself while it was recharging because we had a power outage for 12 hours the day before. So it was fast charging the battery and the battery started smoking. The server was toast. Lion lithium ion smoke inside of a sealed computer. You've seen the phones exploding, right? It's pretty much the same inside the computer. So you have a backup off that machine. At least you might have another server you can restore the database to temporarily until you replace your database server. There. Now you have a, a backup computer in a different room in the building, opposite end of the building. What does that protect you against? Well, no, the server room getting flooded. Our server room is cool. I love using our place for an example because it's such a shit show. Right above the server rack, one day, we noticed there was a little drip of water coming out of the ceiling. It hit top of the rack. Top of the rack is sealed, not a problem. We took down the panel. The plumbing from the upstairs bathroom runs right over our server room for the people upstairs. The P-trap is above the server rack. So having the backup across the building protects you from what? Server room being destroyed. It is literally a shit show. <laughs> no, I kid you not.
The pea trap is that a pea trap blows out after somebody ha after going to Taco Bell, it's over. You know, can you imagine cleaning that up? There'd be a mess. So we have a, we have a rack, a wall-mounted rack in the back of our storage space, and it's a backup server. If somebody wants that server, they're welcome to it. They got to basically take out eight-inch lag bolts out of the wall because the server's bolted to the rack, and not with like little bolts. It's like you know hacksaw level bolts so if they want to steal that server for a day they're welcome to it the a got to unlock the room get into the building and then rip it out of the wall and then walk out with a 25 with about a 30 pound rack mount server under their arm and without anybody seeing them yeah and then of course we have backup off-site down the road at one of our partners one of the partners of the company has is a geek and he's got a backup server running in his basement what does that protect you against? Building on fire. Um, we also happen to store all our databases on an Amazon instance. Why? Uh, because we're a little anal retentive about our data. Um, our accounting data is there, our customer information is there, and our product configuration data is there for all our customers we've ever shipped. Um, what does that protect us against? Asteroid. <laughs> well, think about it, you know. Our office is here. This guy lives four kilometers away from the office. If both those get wiped out, it's probably a natural disaster. You know, but just saying, you know, things could happen and life happens. So that's why you want at least three copies. Um, and I got a typo in that. Hot backups for convenience, cold backups for insurance and data recovery. Um, where I work, we don't actually do the hot backups. Um, because we do three we do three full dumps a day, our databases aren't that big. A full backup of our customer management system takes 36 seconds. So we dump every six hours. I mean, if we lost, you know, six hours of data, woo. I have a backup of it somewhere else <laughs> because we're running the replication to another server also, not in the same instance, but in a different location but we replicate. Um, a cold backups are for recovery. It's the easy way to do recovery. You start a new server, install your database software, and you do a restore, and you're done. you got to work and copy your database. It's the easiest way to move your database. You should test your restore process. I think that goes without saying, right? Um, did anybody hear about the GitHub fiasco? about a month ago, well, at least one of you has, uh, GitLabs. They kind of botched their backups, and the server went poof, and they tried to do a restore, and they discovered that none of their backups were good. And they happened to have a six-hour-old snapshot. So that means that any work that people committed in the last six hours to GitHub was gone. <laughs> that's good um, yeah so somebody was not testing the backups well that means that realistically you should test your restore process after you've created your restore policy your database backup policy by that also being said you should test it occasionally to make sure make sure your backups are good just because you think the backups are running and you see a file being put on the disk does not mean you will be able to restore your backup we had a similar problem with that recently where we started accepting registrations for our software out of some of the Slavic countries. Did you know they have a funny alphabet in Norway and Sweden? And they got some letters that we don't have. And that when you write a backup file and you're not binary encoding the backup file, you try to restore it, things go poof. That's what I discovered six months ago when I decided to do a random check for the first time in a year whether or not our backups were working. And I assume, therefore, we probably didn't have actually working backups for three or four months. Lesson learned. I do a test once a month now. <laughs> it's actually on my calendar at work, and it reminds me, Dan, it's the first of the month. Do a restore on your machine, see if it works. Okay. Um, and there's other stuff, too. I mean, you should also make access policies. Who can access the backups? Uh, you should have a policy. You should also make sure that um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? There's a chain of recovery. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase, the bus theory. Dave Fox, which is the guy where the backups are at this house, gets hit by a bus. Who's going to go into that his house get his backups from, the, from after that? That's a bus theory. Um, or even better, you know, Dan sitting in his office, building gets flattened by a meteor. Asteroid strike. Well then, who's going to get the backups off the Amazon cloud when Dan's the one with the private, the, the, the uh, with the encryption keys sitting on his laptop, which is now slagged, right? You have to have an actual policy and a plan. And there should be more than one person involved in the plan. That's what the point is. Okay. Database backup and recovery. So some of the support tasks includes backup, obviously, an offline cold and an online hot, depending on what kind of data you're working with. Like I said, our databases are small enough that an on offline backup works. We can actually do a live dump while it's running. And the we use Postgres, not MySQL, for most of our databases because that's what we developed with. And Postgres does table locking. So as it runs the backup, it locks each of the tables so the table can't be changed while uh, the backup's happening. And it's cool because it does a temporary lock. In other words, it locks the entire database and it backlogs all the reads and writes to the database while the backup is running. As soon as the backup is done, it applies all the changes. So you get an exact point in time recovery that will always recover. Um, so we do a something between a hot and a cold backup, lukewarm backup, where we can restore any of those backups at any given time. Uh, one we back up every four hours, one we back up every six hours, one we back up nightly, depending on how important the data is. The accounting system backs up twice a day because there's not that much that goes into it. The customer relations system is every four hours. Why? Because the, there's close to 4,000 edits every four hours happening in that database. Between customers registering software, tech support working, people reaching out trying to make money, that kind of stuff. Or, or resellers logging in and seeing what new leads have been sent to them, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's the backup plan. Recovery, you should decide whether you want to restore entire table spaces. In other words, the entire database comes back up or not. Uh, you should test a development environment for doing restores, or at least a test plan. Create a new VM, install a new version of Linux, install the latest version of the database server. It's always good to test against the latest data version, because you test against your old version, you test against the new version, make sure that if you, know, if you have to rebuild, you can. And then you have to have a plan on how to recover bad data. Every once in a while, when things go wrong, it's not the database server that melts, it's the application that has a bad day. And if the, bad, the application starts writing corrupted data to the database, or parts of the database get corrupted, and you didn't realize for a day or two that this was happening, suddenly your backups aren't any good either. So you need to restore from an older point in time, but maybe the customer information is good. And maybe, you know, the lead information is good, but maybe the product configuration data is wonky. You have to have a plan on how to rebuild parts of the data. It's all about plan. Okay. Cold backups are the easiest to do. They're good for when your content doesn't change very much or the users can tolerate downtime. In other words, when you're doing a full backup, a full dump, the server will hang temporarily and people can't work. At work, we've decided a five minute delay four times a day is something somebody can live with. Four times every 12 hours. So realistically, people start work at nine, the backup starts at quarter to nine, the next one happens one o'clock as they're coming back from lunch. The other one's happening at 4 o'clock. Nobody does anything after 4 o'clock anyways. And then, you know, the other one happens when everybody should be home. But well, that's every 12 hours. And then, you know, it'll keep rolling around the clock at night. Who cares? Um, hot backups, they're hard to do. Um, when I used to be a Microsoft SQL server admin, I used to do hot backups, and it sucked. You had to buy special software. 
and it didn't work right three quarters of the time. It would take you days to get it configured to work just right, and then you went, don't touch no more. And then once a week, it's get somebody to go change the tape. Hit the button, the tape comes up, put a new tape in, mark the date on the tape, put it in the safe. Then you go do a restore, and then you discover the differential backups aren't working. So you still lost a week's worth of data in the end. Um, so these are for dynamic mission critical databases. In other words, huge databases. Amazon does hot backups. <coughs> but obviously Amazon has the money to experiment with, make sure their backups work. Um, the other choice you can do also is if you have a clustered environment, you can restore from a cold backup without a service loss. Um, normally in a cluster, you'll have three or four database servers running in parallel. And let's say one of them blows up. <coughs> what you do is you add that one to the replication group, restore from a cold backup, and then the other database servers replicate to it. Um, did you guys learn anything about RAID? RAID? No? Uh, RAID is a technology that you use to keep your disks safe. You put a RAID controller in a computer, you put in three or more drives. Well, you could use RAID 0, which is mirroring. That's not good because um, it never really works right. But you use something like RAID 5 or RAID 6. So you have, say, five disks. The way it works is four of those disks are always being used. One's the hot backup. One of the disks dies. You hit the button on the RAID controller. You pop out the disk. It turns on the other disk. And it starts building the, what was on this disk originally to this other one. So in a cluster environment, it keeps all the different images in sync. So if you add a new one, the other servers sync it up. Therefore, you can restore from a cold backup without anybody even noticing anything went wrong. Um, very complex. Very complicated. Um, but then again, if you're working for a bank or you're working for like Amazon, you're working for the CRA, you know, backups are a good thing. They'll do hot backups all the time. And, well, I already covered that one up earlier, so I guess I don't need to cover that slide anymore. Okay, so, my font went small. Well, that sucked. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about MySQL, because basically that's what this course is based on, is MySQL. And when you back up MySQL, MySQL is a bit of an odd beast. Um, it used to really suck for doing backups. In the last three, four years, five years, it's really improved. Um, so when you do a backup for MySQL and you want to do what's called a cold backup, so a complete system-wide backup, you need to do the database content. <coughs> so you do a full backup of the database, or you can also do a physical bad backup. So you turn off the MySQL server and you copy the data directories using whatever disk replication tools you want. Either one will work. MySQL tends to recover well from that as long as you're not changing the version of the server. Uh, log files. It also has the ability to, uh, they have something called binary log files. So as you, um, it basically keeps copies of all the changes and it rolls the files. So there's points and times when each of the transactions get written to the disk and then it writes them in. And when you do a full backup, it deletes the binary log files and then it starts building up again. Um, those are used for point in time recovery. For example, you back did a full backup yesterday in your database. You've been accumulating the binary log files. And at 11 o'clock, Script Kitty goes and manages to break into your computer and torches your database. In theory, you can do a restore from a binary log. So you grab the full backup, grab the bin last good binary log, and you play them back. There's a, in a minute, I'll be showing some of the commands on the screen. So you can replay the transactions through the day so you can rebuild your database. So those are what they call point in time recovery. Um, or at least that's what MySQL calls a point in time recovery. It's not quite true, but it's close enough. Um, you also want to back up the configuration information, the my.cnf. Um, sometimes it's found under the etc. directory, sometimes it's found in the MySQL directory, or in MAMP, WAMP, it's somewhere in there, Nextamp, it's some other folder. 
basically you need the configuration so that when you restore your server from let's say your server melts you'll have the exact same configuration you're running before um, you also want to back up your cron jobs uh, cron jobs are scheduled jobs that run you know hourly nightly for your backups your database maintenance in other words you want to back up everything you need to restore the database server for this stuff right here you might want to start using a source control system of some sort um, such as uh, bazaar or git although right now after that git meltdown I don't know if I trust them um, or subversion subversion is fine for this you don't need anything fancy for keeping track of your the versions of your config files so that means that as you make changes you can commit your changes and then you can see what the differences were so you can experiment using version control all right the binary log contains all the SQL commands that change data so every insert update or delete gets written into the binary log or depending on how you choose to create the binary logs uh, it'll keep the data that was modified and says so you can choose to either do the statement base or the, the actual row so it keeps track of each change as you that were done you can configure it the uh, the documentation at MySQL Oracle for the binary log stuff you could print it and it's about 28 pages long now to configure the binary log I'm covering it in one slide I'm just making you aware that it's there um, it also contains extra information uh, the execution time how long did it take um, what order did the commands happen in <coughs> obviously so that way you can replay it and tell it stop reco recovering once you reach a certain time once you've played half an hour of recovery stop it's good because you can only you can choose to recover just only so much um, it's in a binary format and it's very efficient it's not text you're welcome to go look at it and it'll just be gobbledygook the binary file is much faster to read than text because uh, it's designed specifically to be read fast uh, there is a utility called MySQL binlog you can use that to actually look at the contents it'll actually decipher to plain text for you you also happen to use MySQL binlog to restore you can play back the changes so you do your full backup recovery then you'd run each of the bin logs one after another so you can restore it bit by bit till you know your data is good um, you turn it on with an extra flag that's supposed to be a double dash as you can see it's just the font doesn't display it well <coughs> and it's log bin equals file name and then what it'll do is it'll create files that are sequential file name dash bin 001 002 so that way it'll just keep building it and ad infinitum uh, the binary log supports transactions which I'm covering later um, and then essentially the service MySQL D which is what the MySQL server is called in Linux it's MySQL D.exe under Windows uh, creates an index file which basically tells the server what all the binary files are so this is a config tool and the configuration for doing binary logging so this is if you have a mission critical database running on MySQL you'll want to use this so you can restore quickly quickly to a point in time that's its purpose so this is for doing hot backups so in theory if your files are being dumped to a specific place you can actually do a real-time backup of each of these files to another server so that if the other server blows up or the first service blows up you've got the playback so you can recover your database quickly um, not saying that you should run mission critical on MySQL but you can all right MySQL dump this is the more common tool uh, most people use this to do their backups why because it's easy it's self-contained you can restore in one command and the command is called MySQL dump and the arguments are there's more than that this is the simplified version normally you have to give it a user or a host name that kind of stuff those of you that have started doing looking at the lab have seen 
some of what's going on. Um, but it's basically MySQL dump, the database name, pipe to a file. If you don't pipe to a file, those of you that have started doing the lab have experienced the screen of matrix going of text going by. The MySQL dump command will dump right to the console if you don't give it somewhere to put the contents. Um, what MySQL dump creates is SQL statements. It'll do the create tables. It'll do the insert statements. If you give it the right parameter, it'll do it also create database. So in theory, you can just you have an entire one file that contains everything you need to restore the database. Not the server, just the database. Um, you can get really, really fancy. And you can feed one server to another server. Um, actually, there's a typo on my slide right here. For some unknown reason, my paste broke my dashes. So this is supposed to be a double dash opt world. Let me just go fix it because that's dumb. There, fixed. So dash opt world pipe to another server. So you can actually do a live backup from one server to the other server and you just send it down the pipe. Um, it's kind of cool. That way you can do hot backups to another live server. It's not replication, but it is live, as long as the connection to the other server is available. If you can't connect to the other server, you've got bigger problems. All right. Now, MySQL dump, there's a few tints. There's a parameter called double dash single transaction. Uh, because there's certain table types called NODB, they support transactions. And when you start a backup, if you're not telling it to basically stop all the other transactions first, which is what single transaction does, you may get your table in an inconsistent state. That means you might have part of the data correct and part of the data changed, and you get, you know, a mix of good and bad data. So if you do a uh, single transaction, it actually locks the database, ref finishes off the current transactions, and then dumps. Um, lock all tables. If you're using MyISM tables, which is the opposite of the NODB, MyISM doesn't support relationships. It's just fast. People use it for fast data access. Uh, you want to lock all the tables so that people can't read and write to it while the backup is running. Um, and then flush logs. Obviously, before you do a full backup, you want to do a flush logs. In other words, anything that's sitting in the binary logs that haven't been processed yet, you want to make sure that all the commands in the pipeline are all done before you do a backup. Um, that's assuming you're using uh, the checkpoints and the binary log. Okay. To restore from a last full backup, let's just say you did a complete backup of the server including the MySQL database. You type in the MySQL command and you pipe in from another file. If you're backing up just a database, you go MySQL space, whatever the database is called, pipe in from the file. And then if you've got incremental changes, <coughs> you just literally do MySQL bin log, the file name, and pipe it into MySQL and poop. MySQL plays the changes back. It's pretty cool. It's just instant. Okay. Believe it or not, that's all there is to backups. Uh, those of you who have started seeing the, the, the lab, you'll see that really all I'm worrying about is whether or not you can dump the database and restore the database. That's the most important part of the backup strategy. Can you back up a file and can you restore the file? I don't know if the contrast level is good enough. All right. So I had a few people say, well, one person asked me, <coughs> actually I had three people ask me, well, why I told them that their conceptual was not a conceptual diagram. That's what a conceptual diagram looks at. It's most basic. This is all I wanted. 
if you did the slightly conceptual with attributes, you would have had the boxes with the little circles around it going around the edges. <coughs> but essentially, you had um, a customer has an invoice and a customer has cars. A car has invoice items. And I missed a box, but invoice has invoice items. An invoice item is inc includes parts and services. That's basically what you needed to be able to do that assignment on the conceptual level. Shoot, man, I would have taken points off myself because I forgot a diamond. <coughs> Holy dry throat. Any questions about what the conceptual should have contained? It's pretty straightforward. It's <coughs> five tables. Holy dry throat. Um, then there was the logical. Which is not complete. Stop it. Really? Anyways, that's... No, we, can we see it? Uh, enough of it. So the conceptual has um, the, the, actually the tables or the entities with their attributes identifying the primary keys and the names of the fields. As you can see, I'm not caring about naming conventions in here yet, but all the basic attributes are there. Everything you needed to do that invoice was there. <coughs> you got all the information for the customer, all the information over the invoice, at least that was on. <coughs> Holy cow. That's on the invoice, the in invoice items, including the price and the description. Um, and then the descriptions of each of the cars. Of course, you could add to this, to each of these, because people know there's more to a car than just a plate number. There's a make, model, year. All I was worried about is whether or not you could extract what was on the invoice. Some people lost points because they didn't cover everything that was on the invoice. Nobody lost points for giving me more than what was on the invoice, unless you added stuff that had nothing to do with what was on the invoice. And even then, I didn't take points away from that. I only took points away if you added stuff that wasn't on the invoice and got it wrong. Right? That's always the danger of getting things a little more creative and you add a little extra, then you're giving more for me to work with and take chunks out of. Um, now I did the physical. Um, I did it in Visio. Why? Because I already had everything in there instead of redoing it again in MySQL Workbench. Uh, but I gave everything data types. The ID is an integer. It's a primary key. Name has an address. Uh, name has a data type. I did put a note that province really should have been a foreign key to a provinces table. Um, however, that would have been an assumption on the design and whether or not you chose to do it. That would have been great. Good job. If you forgot to do it, and you just left a provinces field. I didn't take points away from that because I wasn't expecting it. Um, because you don't know whether or not there's the extra data. The extra data is there. Um, same thing with the parts and services. Um, there should be a parent table of some sort that describes the what kind of parts or service it is, right? Otherwise, you have one giant table that has absolutely everything you do at a garage, including all the bits and pieces. That would include every single part they sell for every single car, every single service for every single car. And did you know a brake job on a Mitsubishi doesn't cost the same thing as a brake job on a Dodge? Therefore, it's a different service level. And that the brakes for a Honda cost more than the brakes for a Ford. Why? Because it's a stupid Honda. But because it's an imported car and the parts cost more in imported cars. Um, same thing there. You got different types of work where some of them could be just shop labor, some of them could be book labor. Um, so theoretically, you could either have one monolithic table like this, 
Or you could have a table that then has a parent category where each of the different items in that table are broken down to its individual pieces. Um, other than that, that covered all the basics. Naming conventions are correct on this diagram. So for those of you that have problems with your naming conventions, I wish I had better contrast. It looks really good on, the, on your screen, but it looks shitty on the projector. Um, everything is lowercase. Tables are plural. Foreign keys, primary keys are all called ID. The foreign keys is the singular version of the parent table name. Car ID. This is the ID of a car. It's the ID of a car. Where do you find it? In the cars table. That was the naming conventions. Um, over half of you lost points on naming conventions. Some of you lost one or two points because you just forgot to make a change. Some of you chose to totally disregard them. And that took a really good chunk out of your grade. Uh, but, I, but I decided to be nice and not take off half a point for every mistake. I took off half a point for every mistake under you didn't name your foreign keys properly. Or I stopped at the halfway mark unless you then made everything a mixed case. Then I took some more points off. And if you ignored all the rules right, you lost all five points. So I was, I didn't take everything off I should have for not following the rules because so many people weren't. Um, <clears throat> any questions about the midterm now that it's all said and done and it's all over with? I'm not saying argue with right now with me about your grade. We can do that after we're done recording. Um, but. Does anybody have any questions about what they thought the data diagram should have been so that we can clarify it for others who might have thought the same thing as you? And nobody has a comment. Okay. Oh, good. Thank God. Let's make class last at least an hour. <laughs> Did you actually look at the invoice? Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. Some people actually have... Right. Well, not really, because your IDs are supposed to be numeric, that auto-increment. These are synthetic keys, so you can find each row uniquely. The invoice number is a separately generated thing. Possibly, it's the ID plus a character. For example, our accounting system uses numeric IDs, but on the invoices, an invoice will be INV dash transaction number. And this number grows for every transaction we do. Whether we create a PO or we create an invoice or we place the sales order, it actually uses the number increments for every single document we create, but it prefixes it with what kind of document was it. So INV dash uh, 122576 is one I fixed today. Uh, if it's an order, it'll be ORD-122775. Or in this case, it, this in this case, he had down his invoice number was Leet. Yeah, if you're just doing straight numeric invoice numbers, that's fine. You can just store it as a NIT and use that. Use the primary key as your invoice number. That's fine. Most accounting systems don't. Don't ask me why, they just don't. Um, I can guarantee, I don't think I've seen a single in, of accounting system that actually, the internal ID that you think I identify the row almost never matches the actual document number. Because you could have a case where um, you were on QuickBooks until January 1st, or April 1st, uh, March 31st, end of the year is March 31st. April 1st, you're no longer using QuickBooks, you're moving off to Great Plains. Now, for your customers, let's say you are at invoice 122,000. In January, you don't want to start at 1 again, you're going to actually start the invoice number at 122,001. But as far as Great Plains is concerned, it's record number 1. That's why the primary key is separated usually from the invoice number. Yep. 
that's pretty much how it is. Um, some of it is left is uh, new developments because of the logging rules in the states for everything, uh, where you have to you have unique document numbers for everything that are independent from the database contents. Um, in theory, if you have to restore the server and some of your data has been lost, the IDs will change because they're auto incremented. Therefore, suddenly your invoice numbers will change for your customers if you're using the primary key as your invoice number, unless you do some magic and some you know, massaging, but auditors don't like it when you massage the data, they get a little upset. By a little upset, I mean they start sweating and they get really mad. Um, at least that's what our auditor does every time he looks at her books and he sees the accountant adjusting for pennies. Well, that's not quite true, but you know, when he's adjusting for dollars, he gets a little mad. Adjusting for pennies is rounding issues. So yes, the invoice number was a point place where I took points off for people because there was an actual character in the invoice number. That means the invoice number should have been stored as a var car. But the rule was that primary keys just should be called ID and as default normally they're numeric so they're synthetic keys that are quick and easy to index and retrieve. It's, it was a, a common-ish mistake. So I'd say about 30% of the class lost a point on that. So you weren't alone. If I took off a point. I don't remember if I did. There's a few where I missed. But I took points off for other stuff. Uh, I de definitely did not fine tooth, fine -tooth comb these, these uh, practicals. I mean, obviously, you were doing it under a timeline in under two hours, right? So you didn't have time to really. So I didn't fine tooth comb it too much. Any other questions? Holy crickets, man. I love it. Ron, I know you got it. Okay, good. There. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's a few things, right? I mean, it depends at this point whether or not you want to make the UI development easier or not. Uh, how many of you have been to Canadian Tire to get car work done? Don't go to Canadian Tire. Just say, just don't do it. Uh, but if you go to Canadian Tire, they'll ask you for your phone number, not your license plate number. And then they look you up and they say, oh, which car is it in today? So it's the caravan. Therefore, the car is associated to you in their system. That way they can look you up and look up the cars you have. As opposed to you can look up the car and add it to the invoice, but so far you don't have the customer either, so you're doing two expensive lookups as opposed to one expensive lookup and one cheap lookup. There's, there's arguments for both sides. What happens if I bring the car and it's actually my mother-in-law's car? And they look me up, well, your car is not listed here. Oh, shoot, it's my mother-in-law's car. Right? Then they'll actually do the invoice against my mother-in-law. Therefore, they'll look her up and, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, okay. But there's, there's pros and cons to each one. It just depends how you want to write your system. You could turn it around and go vehicles first, customers incidental. But then what happens if you're bring, coming in with, I bring in my car and I bring in my son's car to the garage at the same time. One invoice, two invoices, you know. There's no perfect answer. There's no, there's no reason not to and there's no reason to. There's no perfect answer. Um, other stuff you could have thrown in, so I'll just expand upon this a little bit. Other stuff you could have put under cars would have been uh, year, make, model, for example. I mean, you go to Mr. Lube for an oil change. They punch in your license plate number, because at Mr. Lube, you're tracked by license plate. They go the other way around, car, customer. Um, they punch in your license plate number, and they know exactly what car you've got, because, well, assuming you've been there before, 
they put in your plate number and then they know what car you have therefore they don't need to ask you what year is this blah 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 or they punch in the VIN number and that tells them what year make model it is um, you could add year make model on the car but then you have a bigger problem then you need to have at least two more tables one to track the makes one to track the models yeah Yeah, so it gets complicated, right? Where you got, if you're gonna actually start tracking in this the year make a model, then you got to look down the rabbit hole. Going, you got parts and services. So then you separate the parts and the services into two tables, and you can relate this part is available for that car. And things get a little weird. People don't realize that, right? Back in the day, not so much anymore. Um, car manufacturers have really started separating their offerings. Did anybody here remember the old Mazda 323s from the 90s? The time that cute little cars they had? Well, Mercury had a car called a Tracer. The 88 Tracer and the 88 323 was the, uh, the same car with a different interior. So therefore, then you got parts, and the, each part could be related to more than one car. So, you know, then you're adding, what, three more tables. Right? That's the rabbit hole where, for this assignment, the point was, could you derive the minimum of what you needed, not the sum of this this thing, right? This practical, could you derive the minimum of what you needed and if you did add more, did you stop in time before you lost control? Because if you kept adding more to it, that means your conceptual had to be updated, your logic had to be updated. You know, in the hour and 45 minutes you really had to do this, you didn't have time to keep making more revisions. I and mean, that was part of the assessment. Can you actually derive the bare minimum out of this and build based on the bare, bare minimum? Um, same thing with the invoice items in here. Honestly, there should have been a quantity and, you know, a, a line item price. Because sometimes the garages will give you a discount, right? The, let's say the ball joints cost 100 bucks. But you're getting both done, so they'll give you the ball joints at 80 bucks a pop because you know you're buying two, because they paid 10 bucks for them, so they're willing to eat in their profit margin to give you a break. Or at least if you're going to a decent garage, Canadian Tire will actually add 10 bucks. I kid you not. It's I've seen it. Uh, I heard the conversation while I was waiting for my car one day, from an oil change. It was a bad day for that person. Um, but that's you know that should have been included in here too. The quantity. Ball joints times two. You got the whole front end rebuilt. Uh, ball joint replacement times two. Because, you know, you had to do both. Um, oil changes. Okay, times one because there was two separate cars. If you notice the invoice items, there was actually the brought in two cars. One needed a front end job plus an oil change. The other needed just an oil change. One invoice. Uh, customer information. Maybe you want to stick on there an email address. <coughs> Uh, secondary phone number because on there I've got just the one phone number uh, maybe that's my office number but what happens if I say well call myself there's no room on there for a second phone number <coughs> those are all little things you can throw on uh, one person was clever they threw in a mechanics table even though on the invoice it doesn't show who did the work the manager can open up and see who did the work that way they have some extra tracking. So if somebody got clever, added extra stuff, they got it right so they didn't lose points. Uh, if they added a mechanics table and did a you know a hack job out of it, then they would have lost points on the stuff they added extra. Um, yes, there's tons of stuff you can do with this. You can go way past this. Um, but yeah. Um, same thing with the invoice. I've got the invoice number, the invoice date, does it show on there whether it got paid and when was it paid? No. It wasn't on the invoice I gave you guys, but that's stuff you normally see on an invoice that maybe you would have wanted to add on. Uh, maybe I'll take the time sometime this week and I'll actually flesh it out all the way so you guys can have to see the big version of this. I just didn't have time in the last week um, to actually do a fully fleshed. I literally did this diagram as soon as I was done grading everybody's stuff. So now that I was done grading before I unmuted the assignment, I actually sat there and diagrammed it. 
I didn't have it before I did the assignment. I diagrammed it after I was done. Based on, you know, not the feedback, but after seeing what everybody else did. I diagrammed it based on that content. Which is usually the opposite way from t what teachers do. Which is diagram it first and grade everybody against the, the benchmark. All right. Any other questions about the assignments? Um, now, the midterm test grades should be correct, theoretically. <clears throat> I've done my best to make sure they're right, um, since Canvas was acting a little funny with it. Apparently, the automatic regrading is not automatic. So if I fix the answers to a question, and then I say go, i got to go through student by student and say yes, this is right for every single one. So if you feel that your grade looks dumb, uh, by dumb as in you look at all the ones you got right and wrong and the number doesn't add up, let me know so I can take a look see what Canvas is doing to you. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about the test itself? It was somewhat straightforward. Um, all right, so as of today, uh, based on the slideshow and the document, you have everything you need to do the first half of Lab 6. Well, Lab 6, 7 Lab. <clears throat> so, feel free to start working on that. Realistically, it's entirely possible to do the entire lab, both halves in one lab session. So, you know, there you go. Um, No, no, it's due the following week. Because it's not even assigned this week. It's I'm not it's not even available this week. If it's showing up a Sunday, it shouldn't be. Um six sevens later. I moved it. I moved it oh the damn calendar didn't move automatically. Okay, I will fix it so it doesn't look like it's gonna be late. Um and as you've noticed there's a quiz attached to it. Right. If you look at the modules, not at the assignment side, but you look at the modules, you'll see Lab 6 and Lab 6, 7, and below that there's Lab 6, 7 submission box, and it's a quiz. Don't believe the point score that's on that because that's not being used for your grade. It's just, uh, apparently Canvas doesn't let me create zero point questions. So with that, the point of that is you're going to copy paste your answers in that so I don't have to fight with people's word formatting. Because when people copy paste commands from from a DOS prompt, Word sometimes does weird things to it. Uh, and it also depends whether you're not whether you're running a Mac with Windows in a VM, Windows in a boot camp, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10. If anybody here is clever enough to run Linux and happy to run Linux, that guarantee your copy paste will look different because you don't have Word. Um, so. I put up the test so you guys copy paste your commands. Um, some of the questions will be, run this command, what happened? Okay, I can guarantee one of those commands will give you the matrix moment. For those, some people give me the blank look, trust me when you do it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You can control C out of that, kill the com you can break the command, just so give you the heads up. It's really amazing when uh, when uh, 90 megs, uh, 110 megs of text gets shot across your screen all in one go. So you can control C out of that. And um, what do I want description of something like that is it it put it don't put the text to the window, the, the, the backup to the window kind of answer. I just want an actual sentence. Uh, some of them will ask you to copy, pay, tell me the command that you did because it'll say, okay, well, this is what it did, so how would you fix this? So that means you need to go you know, spend a little time with Google. And if you do ask me how to do something that's part of that lab where, you know, it's literally a two-second Google, I will be sending you, let me Google that for you, links. I have a whole list ready to go. Um, because if I can Google it, so can you. So that's the first half of the lab. Next week, we're talking about user permissions and um, possibly transactions. And the week after that, supposedly replication, uh, which apparently is a challenging lab, um, depending on how it all goes. 
Um, but that's it for this week. This week's lecture is a little short. Next week's lecture is a little short, and then they start getting long again. So good, because you guys apparently have a midterm with uh, Jerome next week. So short lectures, not a lot of homework's a good thing. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.